Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I have Craig Wortman with me, and he's going to talk about a very relevant topic for the day, what it takes to be a virtual selling hero. Craig, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Steve. I'm delighted to be here. Hope everybody is well and uh, safe and sound. That's who's listening and including you. Well, I appreciate that, Craig. And, and just so everyone knows, the, the recording date on this is, uh, is late April 2020. So we're in the, in the, the thick of our con- home confinement here. Yeah, the um, thick of home, sure. So, uh, so by way of introduction, uh, Craig is the founder and CEO of Sales Engine. And he's also a renowned author and speaker. He authored the book, What's Your Story? And developed an award-winning course called Entrepreneurial Selling, which was ranked by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 10 courses in the country. He's also a clinical professor of entrepreneurship at the Kellogg School at Northwestern University. And he, and he founded the Kellogg Sales Institute. Very cool. Uh, Craig, first question for you. Yes. The global market is experiencing, obviously, a huge time of disruption. How can sales reps ease their prospects transition into virtual sales? It's a great question. It's a question that is on all of our minds. I'm a seller too. So um, this is very topical at this moment. And I think it's topical all the time. I think one of the things, Steve, we're going to learn as we emerge from this is we're going to use these technologies a lot more. We're gonna be good at it, maybe great at it, and we're gonna come back to them. So I think hopefully this advice and your podcast on this topic will be evergreen. The advice that I've been giving a lot in the last five, I don't know, five or six weeks since we really started to, um, to stay at home and shelter in place is keep it snappy. And I know that may sound sort of light and fluffy. I actually don't think it is. We at the business school, at the sales institute, and then in all of my consulting work and in my venture capital work, we teach something we call the power 10, which is the power 10 disciplines of running a high impact meeting. And what I have found myself saying over and over and over, over the last few weeks to people and audiences, I was telling you before we got started that I gave a talk last night to a TEDx audience, is that these disciplines while they're incredibly important in the physical world, they become even more important in the, the virtual world. And when I say keep it snappy, I mean less is more. So I think the way we help sales reps ease their, tra- their prospects transition is to make it easy for the prospects. You know, if you're my prospect to say, hey, Steve, you know what, I, I would love to, 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 to chat with you um, about uh, some new aspects of our solution. And Steve, I can tell you that if we schedule a half an hour, we'll be done in 20 minutes and you will get 25 minutes worth of value. And, and, and then to, to deliver on that promise. That's hugely important because there, there is now a thing called Zoom fatigue and we've all experienced it and clients are experiencing it too. So the, to the extent that we can put our, our, we can see through our prospects' eyes at what they're going through and what their Zoom or WebEx day is like, relate to it, but then act on it by keeping it snappy. I think it's a, actually a big deal. It's not a little deal. It's a big deal. Absolutely. I've, I've, I've got a little Zoom fatigue myself. <laughs> I, think, I think we all are experiencing that. And, and, to, and to, to, to allow people some, it's not relief necessarily, but just the knowledge and comfort that, you know, and I'll turn the tables. You're, you're my seller. You're my field salesperson who's now virtual. And I just know when I talk to Steve, and I hope I can say this out loud. I didn't ask you before we got on, you know, shit's going to get done. It's just going to get done with him. Yeah. But all these other meetings I'm having today are going to be sloppy and undisciplined compared to Steve. Mm-hmm. And if you can set that tone right off the bat with people, you are winning. Yeah, that, that, that's a, an excellent point and, uh, and one we should all be keeping in mind. How do you think, uh, how can sales managers make the transition to virtual sales easier for sales teams who were previously in field sales? Yeah, we, again, at the Sales Institute, we spend a lot of time with sales leaders. We're doing a, 
I'm doing a huge sales culture transformation project right now with um, a huge tech company that you all know of. They have 1,200 sales managers of about 11,000 sellers. So it's a sizable project. And the thing we're telling them is model the behavior, practice and feedback. And so just a couple of sentences on each, you know, model the behavior is fairly obvious. So the way we sales leaders can help our people is to model the behavior. So we run crisp virtual meetings. There is no fluff. We don't pile on. There's no fat. There's just muscle. So that's modeling. And then practicing is, you know, <laughs> and I can say this because I'm a sales guy, so I don't I hope I don't rub everybody the wrong way when I say this, but you know, we salespeople, a lot of times we don't like to practice. We like to be in the game, um, but we know from elite performance and studying elite performance in athletics, in music, and in sales that the elite performers are the ones that practice. So to the extent that, you know, my boss, Steve, can say, you know, hey, Craig, you've got a high stakes virtual meeting coming up with you know, XYZ company on Thursday, let's you and I get on the phone on a Zoom for half an hour, full dress rehearsal, and let's hammer this thing. And I'll give you some feedback. And that's the third. Feedback is absolutely key. It's something that we've studied uh, in some depth and companies, and I'm, I feel like I'm being pretty blunt early in this podcast, but companies don't do this well. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard. It's actually surprisingly hard to give constructive feedback. And leaders need to do this and the best leaders are the ones that give feedback it's a the heath brothers have a great i just reread the power of moments and they have this great little anecdote in the middle of the power of moments where they say you know the greatest coach that you remember in your life wasn't the great guy who you know you don't say boy steve was just a great coach he had no expectations for me and he just kind of let us do whatever we want you would never say that about a great coach what you would say is, you know, he kicked my butt a little bit and he made me practice and he gave me feedback when I didn't want to hear it. That's how we become great. So I think that's the, those three things taken in combination are real, again, obvious on their surface, hard to do, takes tremendous yeah. discipline. It's way easier to hold as a belief than it is to put it to practice, I'm afraid. You got it, my friend. Um, how about prospecting? How can salespeople best reach out to prospects virtually? You know, I actually, perhaps controversially, I don't think this has changed at all. What I've been arguing for is prospecting. Again, nobody's going to want to hear what I'm about to say. Prospecting should go up in this time. I've had so many questions from sellers and, you know, and again, some very, very powerful companies that have reached out and said, at this weird time when everybody's freaked out, should we still be doing lead gen? And my answer is, and maybe I'm just being overly blunt, but my answer is, of course you should. If you have something of value to offer, you should be doing it more. And so I, I actually don't think this has changed. Here's what I think has changed about prospecting. And it's, it's of a theme already in this podcast is ask for less time. So, index down on time and index up on empathy. And what I mean by empathy is do not start any prospecting call or Zoom or whatever you use without with getting right to business. Just simply say, hey, Steve, how are you? How's you how, how are you and yours? Everybody's safe and sound? That's all, it doesn't have to be, you know, you're not lying on my couch. This is not necessarily therapy. It doesn't have to be that unless, unless people go there. I've had people go there. I've had people say, I'm having a shit week. And I say, hey, what's going on? Talk to me. And yeah. business moves from 20 minutes down to three. And you know what? I win in that situation. And I, I don't mean to make it sound transactional. It's a win-win. I've given that person some, some, some shoulder time. I've asked some great questions. I've empathized. And then we did a little bit of business versus just being always drive, drive, drive. But if that's going to be true, then I think we need to ramp up our prospecting. And this is a great time to do it. Now, one thing that goes hand in glove with more time for empathy is saying, you know, Steve, I realize that I'm reaching out to you on a new topic that I'd like you to consider. Please understand, my friend, if now is not the right time, tell me and I will, I will cease and desist. That's mm -hmm. all you have to say. I think if you say that, people are more, they have more uh, momentum and more grace in wanting to hear your message. Yeah, and I think that's exactly 
a key point here. Keep reaching out, but do it with empathy. You should still be doing lead gen. And then the, the with keeping in the back of your mind, if, if it's not a good time, be more willing to back off right now than, than normal. Absolutely. Be willing to back off. And, and even in, in the process of backing off, again, you got to really be careful and, and skilled at saying this kind of stuff with grace and humility, and it's got to be authentic. But, you know, if you say, hey, Steve, if now is not the right time, you just tell me. And you say to me, hey, Craig, you know, I'm going to be honest, now is not the right time. And I say, hey, guy, I hear you. Let me ask you two questions. When do you think I can reach out to you? And if you don't know, just tell me you don't know, and I will, I will go dark for a while. No problem at all. My second question is, is there anyone in your immediate network who, do you, who you think would be interested in this conversation? Mm -hmm. There is nothing wrong with asking for references. It's striking when you study this. Many, many salespeople, myself included in my career, have been terrible at asking for references. Even though we're doing kick-ass work, we're, we're just weird about asking for references. And I think, again, like this time is a time for lead gen, there's nothing wrong. As long as you're super gracious and incredibly humble in the ask, you can ask. And people yeah. will respond. They will. Yeah, it's always a good time to, to ask for references. And, and now is certainly no exception. And, and, you know, people are never offended if you ask for a reference. So this is a, we had Joanne Black who wrote two books on how to um, get references and how, like the different strategies to go about it, different tactics. Uh, we had her on the, on the show probably a year and a half ago. And that's, that's, definitely one to go back and listen to again so we all just need to be reminded all the time it's never a bad time to do a better job asking existing customers who are happy with you uh or just who understand what you do if, right if they if they would like if they know of anyone who could use what you do it's it's always a good time to do that it never hurts well, it, Joanne is undoubtedly a better resource on that than I am and more knowledgeable but it's striking I mean it's like it's, it's the same as running what we call running high impact meetings that are crisp. It never, it, it never gets old. I mean, because we all, I mean, I've been at the sales game for so long. I still have to learn and relearn how to keep meetings really tight. Yeah. Uh, it going seems back so obvious and it's not. It, it's, uh, it's one of these fundamentals that you can always go back to and ask yourself, could I do a little better at this? Even if you were a nine out of 10 on it, then yeah, you could do a little better. It's one of the, <laughs> almost no one's can. perfect at, at getting referrals off. Almost no one's perfect at, at leading crisp meetings. Um, we could all improve. Undoubtedly. So well, you, you mentioned preparation a minute ago. Yeah. What do you think is is are good strategies and tactics for a sales rep to best prepare for virtual meetings? Are there any secret ingredients to hosting successful virtual meetings that, that might not be top of mind for people? Yeah, I mean, this is one of those answers, Steve, where again, it's this, all of this stuff is critical in the physical world, but I do think this is one of these situations we're in right now where this stuff gets amped up. So I, I, I have five things and the, the two bookends are opener and closer the opener we've already mentioned, so we'll make short work of that, and that's empathy, open with empathy. And then the closer, and I'll get to the middle, closer is make people an offer. I was on the phone this very morning with a, a pretty, uh, one of the most famous guys uh, that a lot of people don't know, because he's, he's invented over 1,300 products. His name is Bob Mesta, and I'm, I'm lucky to call him a friend. He's an amazing guy. First question he asked me. So this was at the top of the call, not the bottom. I usually do this at the bottom of the call. But at the top of the call, he said, Craig, is there anything I can do for you? And that's just a, an act of generosity. Again, it has to be authentic. But in this world at this time, is there a thing that I can do for you that I'm uniquely positioned to do? And if I can do it, I will do it. And of course, you don't make that offer if you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Now in the middle, so those are the bookends that I like. And again, people use these differently, but in the middle, the, 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 one of the secret ingredients is, is being really prepared and looking at what you want to cover and the arc of what you want to cover. And then, and I've just been using this number, I don't know if it's right, but taking 30% out, taking 30% out. So less is, that's the act of less is more, is just saying, you know what? I was going to cover these four things with Steve. I'm only going to cover three of these, or I'm going to cover two of these. Mm. And I'm going to make it known to him that, you know, there's a bunch of stuff I want to talk about. 
Steve, to keep this moving quickly and to respect your day and Zoom fatigue and all that, I'm gonna keep this really snappy and we're gonna do a couple things. And then the two that, that I, I've been um, talking a lot about is positive energy. Just in, find a way to infuse positive energy into, these, into this virtual world. I think that is actually a secret ingredient and it goes, it's a, it's a first cousin with my last one, which is my fifth one, which is playfulness. Just find a way to be playful. Um, you know, an example that just came up today was um, I was on a Zoom with a whole bunch of people and you know how you have gallery view, right? Where you can see everybody. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a talk and somebody's sitting there and, and he looked like he was, he was listening, you know, you can't, it's hard to tell, but he looked like he was really paying attention. And this enormous dog jumped onto his lap. And, you know, there, you just want to, you want to, it's one of those things where we, t we cheat salespeople, you know, don't ignore the elephant in the room. And this enormous, beautiful dog jumps on his lap and he's like, you know, holy shit, you know, and the dog is in the, in the frame. And, you know, to say something like, God, that, that dog seems to really be enjoying our, be enjoying our discussion, you know, just anything. And, and yeah. sometimes I can pull off funny. Sometimes I can't. It's mm -hmm. the attempt that makes it worthwhile and just being a little bit playful and, not taking ourselves too seriously. I think those combination of things is really, really powerful. Because again, remember the goal, and I haven't said it to you this way, but in my MBA and my executive MBA classroom, I say this all the time. What you want to achieve in every single virtual meeting, in every single physical meeting, is that Steve drives home to his family or whatever, you know, goes, walks from the office to the living room now into, into his family dinner, and of the 11 meetings he had today, he's thinking about you. Because that is achievable. That is absolutely achievable, but you gotta have, I love your question, man. It's secret ingredients. You gotta have the secret ingredients. Just like the meal that you remember is the one that had the best ingredients and got cooked and made by the chef the best and plated beautifully and all that stuff, right? A sales meeting's exactly the same. So I think these sort of five things, empathy, less is more, positive energy, playfulness, and then at the end, making an offer is a unique combination of secret ingredients that will elevate you amongst all the other meetings that person is having that day or that week. Well, let's talk about more about the making an offer part. Um, mm -hmm. how, how, how should people think about that? How should they approach that? How is it different today? I was on the phone. Um, I, well, let me start at the end. I, I don't know, Steve, if it's different today. You're picking up, you guys are picking up a theme on what I've been saying. I don't yeah. know that the virtual world changes a lot of this stuff other than some of these, you know, unique things to when the dog jumps into the frame, say something about it, like have some fun with it, because that doesn't happen in the physical world. Making an offer, I think, is listening really closely. One of the things we know about high-performing salespeople is they are incredible listeners. So they listen at multiple levels. Most people listen at the surface level, what you're saying. And as you're saying it, I'm cranking a response. And, and look, that's a natural human, you know, what a psychologist would call a default behavior. Great salespeople listen at the next level down, which is why does it matter what you're saying? Why does that matter to you? And then what do you feel about this? So a third layer down, what do you feel? And again, now we're back to empathy. Empathy, the word, literally means to feel with. Right. So um, great sellers listen at three levels. If you're listening at three levels, you will often hear people say things. And I'm going to give you a hard example from my own life. Last week, I was on the phone with a giant quick service restaurant that, you know, and uh, I'm doing some work for them over the summer. And they were struggling like everybody else with this virtual world. And I, you know, I teach online courses and I don't want to portray myself as some Zoom expert, but I've used it a lot. I've done a lot of webinars. I've taught MBA students virtually. So I've had some experience with this. And at the end of our meeting about the stuff we're doing this summer, I said, Dan, would your learning group benefit from a Zoom lecture about how to use the technology and how to teach with it and what the pedagogy is? And it was funny, Steve, because there was a long pause and he said, wow, that would be great. I'd have to figure out how much that costs. And I said, Dan, you've misunderstood me. I am making you an offer. I will do this. I'm not asking for money. And we had a laugh. It was a sort of an awkward, funny laugh moment. And he sort of like, he's like, oh my God, 
Well, yes. And so now we're getting it set up. It's something I can do. It'll cost me an hour, big deal. And it, but it's something I can do to, to get a lot of learning professionals all over the world into a Zoom and say, here's what I've learned about how to do a Zoom. Stuff like that. Just if we're listening closely or, and or we know our prospects, we probably have a sense of what they need, what their lives are like, what books interest them, what their hobbies are, what their kids are working on, stuff like that. And it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be a huge gift. It can just be a small offer that changes the trajectory of somebody's day. So that's what I mean by making offers. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's fantastic advice. Um, what about, uh, what are, what are some, what about some mishaps that occur when you're, when you're in the, the world of zoom, like canceled calls are a really common problem, technology problems that, that come up in, in real time. How, how can sellers think about those and think about avoiding some of those problems or, or, or getting ahead of them? Yeah, I, so, um, I'm a, I'm, I'm a tool builder at the sales Institute. We just build tools. One of the tools I've, that never occurred to me to have that I've built in the last five weeks with my, with my consulting team is what I call a pre 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 flight checklist. I used it today before we got on the, on this podcast. And I think, cause I think you're right. So I think one of the things that we've learned in the virtual world is some people are better than others at technology. And so you end up spending the first five minutes dealing with, you know, your audio is not on. I can't hear you, your video. You know, and you know this is what everybody mm -hmm. listening has, gone, has lived this life now for the last five weeks at least. And so we just know that. So you can do a couple of things. You can create a tool and we send this to clients and we say, here's our pre-flight checklist. It's got screenshots, arrows, the whole deal. It's, but it's as simple as we possibly can get it. So people can just say, ah, okay, you know what? I do have to check that box or I have to open the thing or do this or do that. And it seems to cut, it doesn't end the snafus, but it seems to really do a great job getting that stuff squared away. So I think that's, I think that's one of the things that we can do to avoid the normal stuff where people are just messing up and eating into valuable time. Because that also leaves a bad taste in their mouth. Absolutely. I mean, no, no one likes to waste time. Right. Um, and, and the technology is, uh, is tricky. Or earlier today, for some reason, I couldn't get Zoom to work on my phone. Don't know why. I've used it a hundred times in the last three weeks, but just the sound wouldn't come through. Still haven't figured out why. <laughs> it just, it, you know, it just happens. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, again, we can, we can help. If you could create a screenshot and, and put a little red circle over it and say, hey, Steve, next time that happens, click on this. Yeah. That's a, you know, that's, a, that's an offer. It's a touch, you know, and you, you go, oh, that was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. What, what about, uh, what about canceled calls and, and customers ghosting people, especially, you know, for, for our listeners, you know, usually they're used to dropping by seeing people face to face and, yeah. and maybe, you know, if you're face to face with someone, you just, you have their attention in a different way than if you're setting a meeting, how would you, what would you advise to, to, uh, to a salesperson who's, who's struggling with those things today? Yeah, I'm smiling because we, you know, yet again, we have, so we have a tool and there's a module that I teach in my online course, my online course called Mastering Sales. And one of the modules in module seven, we talk about a tool that I call getting a deal unstuck. So getting deals unstuck. We all have stuck deals. I have stuck deals right now mm -hmm. where people are ghosting or they're just stuck for whatever reason. And we have a, we have a three, um, a three move set of skills and disciplines. We call it getting help, getting creative and getting scrappy and they all have different meetings. So if somebody is ghosting you, you know, getting help can be as simple as calling the question. You know, I, I literally leave you a voicemail and I just say, hey Steve, you know, it's been some time since we talked. And by the way, I accept responsibility for that. You know, one of the things that we were going to talk about is X. And I just wanna call the question, Steve, are we at a stopping point here or am I just misinterpreting silence? Like, are you just heads down busy on other stuff? Either answer is fine, but please let me know. Mm -hmm. Even that, just that little twist can help. Another way to get help would be to uh, help get, ask your manager to call that person. It's striking how few, and again, I'm guilty as the next salesperson on this in my career, not asking my boss for help. Saying, hey, you know, Susan, will you, call, will you call Steve and see if you can shake the tree a little bit? Let's see if we can get this thing back on track. Here's the last communication we had, blah, blah, blah get him or her set up to, to have a successful voicemail or call. So that's getting help. 
getting creative is, you know, is things like, um, you know, we're big on visuals, creating visuals. So to send you something that is bespoke to the problem that you're having, that's got some design sensibility. I've got a designer on my team and we're constantly having her draw pictures of what is the issue and sending that along. And that's just getting creative. Like, Hey, Steve, I've been thinking about this challenge, you know, as you've been ghosting me, I've been thinking about this challenge. You don't, you don't say that, but as you've been <laughs> ghosting me, what I would say is go back and do that visual and then offer that as something to get the thing back on track. Getting scrappy is where it gets a little bit. I mean, it's, it's the word, right? It gets a little bit tougher. Like, um, have go around the person go back to your stakeholder map which is another tool and see if you can go around the person again with grace and humility but if a person is truly ghosting you it's time to it's time to pick up the red phone and and call the emergency line like it's time to do something you know another another sort of one that sits on the border between creative and scrappy is um i've had a i had a portfolio company that calls has a unbelievable solution that has a tremendous roi but they're small and they're, they're a startup and they're, it's really hard to get attention in a crowded space. And they're trying to get a hold of CFOs, you know, who are notoriously hard to get in front of as salespeople. And I said, send a FedEx letter, a really well-written FedEx letter that's just asking for 10 minutes of time. Keep the ask tiny and be really creative and scrappy about how you get that letter to them. Got tremendous results. It's I mean, funny, I always ask uh... people, how many FedEx letters have you gotten? and throw them directly away without opening them? The answer is none. Zero ever. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, like, it, it, it's it's hard to get, like, in front of me, you know, my, my phone. I, I keep the phone hidden. Like, if you call the company, you can't get to me in any way, if it, which is, causes problems sometimes because people that should be able to get to me, like, if my mom called, she would be able to get a hold of me. But, sure. you know, the, and then LinkedIn's a disaster. I've got to have, you know, 10,000 messages in there with all the in-mails, you know, it's impossible to keep track of. Yep. But if you send me a letter, it doesn't have to be a FedEx letter. It could be any letter. It will land on my desk and I will open it and read it. <laughs> but a FedEx letter, I will read like immediately because it comes in that big cool envelope and you get to rip it open. And you know. yep. <laughs> Well, and, and what we're finding even in this, in this virus time that we live in, which is kind of scary, you know, scary for a lot of reasons, we're, we are still advocating and I've been advocating for a dozen years since I've been teaching at the MBA level write handwritten thank you notes. And you know, the, the younger salespeople are, and I'm not picking on young people, but the younger people are, the more they roll their eyes and they think that's old school. It is absolutely positively not old school. And you know, don't take my word for this. There is a ton of research that indicates that you are more credible and confident and you have better conversions if you write thank you notes. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a touch in a, in, a, in a digital world and it still makes a difference. It's crazy. In fact, I would argue it makes more of a difference today than it did when our you know, great grandparents were writing letters all the time. Yeah, that, that absolutely connects you to people. And I, this, that's something that I've been advocating for years and I almost never do myself. I even have a big box of them that I never send out because it's just, it's that extra, it's that extra step, but it's, I, I still, even though I don't, you know, do as I say, not as I do, but. <laughs> it's, well, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. Um, you know, I, I'm so nuts. You know, we study, we study the knowledge, skill, and discipline of high-performing salespeople. And so, and, and this does not mean I'm disciplined on every step of the sales process. I'm not. I'm still, I'm a learner myself. I'm still a salesperson and I'm still learning, but I, I track my discipline and my routines really, really carefully. And I, I write about an average of 450 thank you notes a year. Like oh, wow. I take this dead serious, but now I've got a process. It takes me about 20 seconds to write a thank you note. So this is not a heavy lift. Mm -hmm. If you do the math, it's not a big deal over the course of a year. It's not a big deal at all. It's yeah. just a discipline. It's like eating healthy. I mean, it's a discipline. Uh, I love it. Well, what about, uh, and I, I think it really connects you to your customer when you, or prospect when, when you do that. Um, what, what, what are some other strategies that you can think of that would help a field salesperson in this time who's, who's maybe struggling to connect with their prospects and customers virtually in the same way that they're able to in, in, in the real world? Yeah, I, you know, I was saying, we were talking earlier about positive energy and playfulness. There's actually a, a, a click or two down underneath that that is really profound. I've actually been doing a bunch of virtual talks on, on self-development. And what that means is, you know, the best way we can 
be successful working from home, the best way we can be successful selling in this virtual world is to be disciplined ourselves. And what, what that means is we should have a routine. Um, you know, I've talked about discipline a lot already, but you know, a routine is, are all the obvious usual suspects, getting up early, working out. I mean, the, the two, the, probably the two best things you can do to stay frosty and channel that positive energy and playfulness is get up early and work out. Because, yeah. you know, we all know what happens when you get up early. Um, you know, you, you just get shit done. Like you get through all the crap, you get through the email, and you actually can structure a more productive day. And we know this is true of high performers. And the other high performer thing high performers do most often is take care of themselves by working out. Because yeah. you, you actually have a higher level of energy when you've worked out. And, and you don't even have to say it. You just, you just have it. I mean, Amy Cuddy at Harvard's done research on, on the physiology of, of how you hold yourself. We've got tons of research on working out about this too. So, you know, my, my words right now that I've been saying a lot are routine and discipline and just well, however that works for you, find it and find it, especially in this time where people are, you know, you do have more time in the day. Why? Because you're not commuting. Yeah. And so well, you do have more time. The question is, how are you filling that time? And that's a scary answer for some people. Mm -hmm. and generally with Netflix, uh, I, I've, I've got employees that were commuting two hours a day and, and they're having some of the most productive times in their lives right now because they, two hours each way, that's four hours a day. That's, you know, 20 hours a week. They've got 20 hours back. And, and, and it's like their energetic awake times that they were spending doing that. So it can be, I think, some people are finding themselves really productive and getting a ton of things done right now, which is, which, uh, which is great. And I think your, your advice on, on exercise is, is dead on. I mean, just, you got to get out and move your body for 45 minutes, an hour every day, just because if, if not, then all you're doing is sitting in, sitting in your living room and then walking to your bedroom and, and, and back like twice a day. Like it's not, it's not, uh, it's not enough. It makes a huge difference. And, you know, at the risk of everybody in your audience thinking I'm a total freak, I mean, I, I do take this really seriously. One decision I made five weeks ago is that I'm going to use the time that has been handed to me as a gift to read, try to read all the books that have been piling up on my book list. So I, I have watched exactly one movie in five weeks. And that, wow. that, that does not mean that I'm not enjoying it. Like, you know, I'm going to go home after this. I'm going to have a couple beers with my family. Like I'll have, I have a ton of fun. Like I'm not some weirdo or maybe I am, but I just <laughs> like, the answer is, you know, should I watch this movie or, or, or can I hang with my family and have a couple beers or, you know, can I, can I kick off and go to bed a half an hour early and, and dig into that, bro that Heath brothers book that I've been dying to revisit for a couple years. And if the answer is the latter, I'm finding that I have more energy and more insights and more to offer. So that's, you know, that's been really, it's been really fun. And it doesn't, it doesn't happen every day. I mean, some days I, like any human, I break the rules. Like it's totally fine. But mm -hmm. routines are absolutely key, in the, especially in this time. Yeah. And I, I like the point about waking up early too, because I, I think a lot of people, you know, their first meetings at 930, so they don't roll out of bed till, till nine. And if you're used to having to wake up at seven, that's a huge lifestyle change, you know, but, and uh, I think that the taking away the commute and taking away the, the need to uh, dress ourselves and stuff is, is, uh, is change. It, it does. Uh, we have more time in the morning, but you can still wake up at the same time and, and use that time for, for something else that's productive. And, in, and even in, in the normal, the normal course of the world, you know, I, I, I found some of, some of the most productive times in my life were, were the ones where I just, force myself to get up earlier or early in the morning and, and do something productive that I really wanted to get done, whether it was, you know, working out on a regular basis, whether it was writing, whether it was, uh, you know, being like, whatever the thing is, so taking that time, waking up earlier and just dedicating two hours to that thing that I wanted to do. I found that to be very, uh, very functional over the years. This is kind of a natural time to be able to do that because our day doesn't start for later. Or until it's, later. It's, I love the way you say that. It's a natural time to do this stuff. And just, you know, it's like, it's like we talked about before. It's practice. Just pra practice a new routine and, you know, really try to stick with it. It's, it, will, it, will, it will change, you know, not to get cheesy here, but it'll change your life. It will change your life. And we, again, we study high performers. We know this. We know this from all kinds of data. Yeah. Well, tell me another thing that, uh, 
that I think you're given your expertise would be helpful for this group of listeners to hear from you. What tips would you give to giving presentations virtually as opposed to in person? A lot of people are giving virtual presentations now who, who historically have been meeting with their customers face to face. What, what thoughts do you have for those people? I'm going to use a Heath Brothers line, so I want to, I'm, I'm a partly an academic, so I will always want to give credit where credit is due. They use this great phrase called break the script, and man, is that important. Um, you know, I, and I heard another line, I think I read this this morning somewhere on a, on a blog post. Somebody said, watching PowerPoint presentations in a physical meeting is excruciatingly horrible. Watching PowerPoints through Zoom is like watching paint dry through Zoom. Like it's, it's, it's worse. Yeah. And so what I mean by Steve, by break the script is I would surprise people in a pleasant way. So if you're given presentations, don't use slides. If you use slides, if you have to use slides, use one or two and take a page from the Steve Jobs book, which is show a picture. And, and look, I, I it's, it's, it's without doubt that some of the audience is sort of rolling their eyes right now going, you know, Craig, I got a technical solution. How can you possibly do that? And my, I'm going to push right back and say, because you're a salesperson, that's why. You're, you're incredibly talented. And your job is to paint a picture for me of that technical solution. That's your job. Don't, my, my dear friend and professor at Chicago Booth, I taught for about a decade at, at Chicago Booth, Steve, before I moved to Kellogg. My dear friend, Dr. Deutsch, Waverly Deutsch. She's just an unbelievably powerful professor and woman. And she said this great phrase one time that has been coming out of my mouth about every day for the past 12 years. She said, people will not work to understand your message. You have to work to be understood. And man, is that true. And it's so true in presentations where we put a bunch of PowerPoint crap together. And guys, I've done this. Like everybody listening, I've made all of these mistakes a thousand times. We, we put the PowerPoint stuff together. It makes sense to us. But what we haven't done is be our audience and say, you know, this guy's going to have kids running behind him down the hall. He's at Zoom. He's stressed as hell, probably stressed about his job. He's got wicked bad Zoom fatigue. How can I make this person's life better? I'm going to show him two slides. And I'm going to tell him, Steve, I'm going to walk you through two slides. And that's probably too, too many. But I've got a couple things I want you to see. And then we're going to, and then we're going to have a chat. Again, you will be that person that rises above. You just will. Uh, I think that's fantastic advice. I feel like it's, and this is a a challenge because so many, so many of our listeners here, outside salespeople there, there is just a natural thing with, with certain types of products that you, it's really better to sell them in person. And that's why their companies chose to have outside sales teams as opposed to just putting what the thing their company does on, on a website or yep. uh, having inside salespeople doing it or opening stores and having a retail environment. There was a reason they had a field sales team and that was that this product is best sold uh, with field sales. And oh, I think yeah. that, you know, there, there is a, it, it, when you're selling online or, you know, over zoom or whatever it there, not only is it harder to understand your message, like you were saying, it's harder. It's also, you have, you have less time to get it across in. So it's almost like instead of a thir- the 30 minutes of attention span, you'd be able to capture face to face. Now you have 10 to before they just like zone out and, and like exactly. you say, it's, it's, it's paint drying, right? So it's harder to understand you and you have less time to really get the point across in. Well, and, and, and one more thought for your, your, your group, Steve is, not only is, is everything you said just, just said true, I would add one more tool to the toolkit and that's the ability, what I call the ability to tell the right story at the right time for the right reasons. And, and I'll be bluntly honest, I have, a, you know, I have a dog in this race. I wrote a book on storytelling. You gotta have, you know, the metaphor here is you've got a quiver of arrows on your back. They work just as well on Zoom as they do in the physical world. And when I need to pull out a story out of, out of my quiver, I got the right story at the right time for the right reasons. I, if you're going to give any presentations, I would think through, you know, I told you I gave a TEDx talk last night. It's a, those things are really, they go really fast. I had two stories and I had to reach back into my quiver and go, okay, what are the two best stories I know for this audience at this point in time at night, probably having a glass of wine 
what, what stories am I going to tell? So all those things went through my head. But again, that's me trying to, and it doesn't mean I do this well every time, but it's me trying to get behind the eyes of the audience. You know, I'm a glass and a half of wine in. I got this guy showing up on Zoom to do this TED Talk. You know, what mindset am I in? And so I picked some stories that I thought would be, have a little bit of fun edge to them, but also take you on a journey. But I had the quiver of arrows on my back. So I was able to reach back and go, oh yeah, that one and that one. It's funny. Storytelling is so important in sales. And I, and, and, uh, I might not be the sharpest pencil in the box because I had forgotten that you wrote the book on storytelling since when we were introduced, but, uh, you know, it just wasn't top of mind right now. But like, oh, while we were going okay. through this, this, this interview, I was like, man, this guy is really good at telling stories. He's really doing a great job of like bringing stories into his messaging. And I, just, you know, forgot that you wrote the book on it. So, <laughs> Well, they say, like, keep in mind, my friend, they say that, uh, they, they say, I don't know who said this, I should know this, like Mark Twain or somebody famous, it's probably not him, but they said, when you write a book, it's the beginning of your learning journey, not the end. And I can tell you, oh my God, is that true? Like I learn, I have these funny moments where I read some research on story. I'm like, God, why the hell didn't I know that when I wrote, like, I'm an idiot, you know, and I, I look back on my book, I'm like, oh, it's so incomplete, you know, because we're constantly learning. Yeah, well, well, you're doing a great job with your stories, I can tell you that much. Good, it, well, thank it, you. It jumped, it jumped right off the page at me. <laughs> awesome, awesome, I'm trying. Um, what about, what about uh, closing? How, how has closing changed virtually? You, you, you've alluded to it earlier. What, what would you, if you're giving advice to, the, to people how should they change their strategies? What should they do to, in this new world we're in? So I have two thoughts here. One is sort of one inch above the ground and one is sort of high level. So the one inch above the ground is, you know, there's, there's different definitions of closing, right? There's not, there's not necessarily closing the deal, which actually I think you're asking about. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Closing the deal? Yeah. Okay, and we'll get there. But then there's closing each meeting. So closing each meeting where I, one of the things I think Zoom is teaching, or, you know, doing this virtually is teaching us, Zoom, WebEx, go to meeting, whatever, is the necessity of saying, okay, Steve, let me be, as we close up, let me be really crisp about our next steps. And again, we believe that there, at the Kellogg Sales Institute, there are actually six steps to closing, not one. You know what the, you know what the number one step of closing a meeting is? Thank you. There's actually six steps. And the sixth one is thank you. But one of them, the fourth, is action items and accountabilities. Here, when we're closing with a small C, we've gotta be really super crisp. Like, Steve, here's what I owe you. I will get this by 9.30 tomorrow morning. And the next time we talk, we will do X and Y. How does that sound? Next right, like step super to, crisp. Yeah, I always have running in the back of my mind, and I don't know who's, who, where I got this, but next step, when, and who owns that step. Yep, um, action, and that's a great way to say it. I call it action items and accountabilities, same thing. Now. To your question, which I call capital C closing, I mean, closing the deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, I have an unusual thought about this. I, the older I get and the more I study high performers, we at the Sales Institute have a definition of closing. Our definition of closing is closing is the natural outcome of a sale done well. And again, you know, I'm gonna, I will end where we started. I, you know, I think that can sound fluffy. I don't think it is at all. No, I don't if think it is at do, all. It's, this is exactly my philosophy. I yeah, say it in a different I mean, way, but I could not agree more. It's, you know, and, and, and look, I started selling, you know, 350 years ago at IBM and I'm, I feel like the luckiest guy on the planet. I loved IBM. I love IBM to this day. They gave me so much. They took did, a- Did you go through their, uh, did you go through their global, what was it called, global sales school? I went through global sales school. So yep. did I, that, that was, uh, that's how I started my sales career. Oh, that's awesome. So did I, I didn't know we had that in common. That's super fun. And, and so, and so with the preface of that, I absolutely dearly love IBM to this day. One of the things I learned there, I had to unlearn. We learned um, five techniques for closing. You know, the puppy dog close, the hard close, the soft close, the, the assumptive close and mm -hmm. the trial close, I think were the five. Mm -hmm. God, I can't believe I remember that. And so <laughs> it stuck with you. <laughs> it stuck with me. And you know what? And that's fine. And I understand. I'm not criticizing IBM. I understand why they did that because they took a bunch of young kids like us who were who would otherwise not like steer a thousand miles away from closing because we're scared, or at least I was, and they taught us how to do it. So that that in and of itself has value. As I've grown up, 
and I've started a few companies and I've just sort of muddled through this and started studying this stuff for a dozen years, I am of the, of the mind that when you show up for people and you show up every day in every way and you go above and beyond and you're super crisp, you will close. It's the natural outcome of being a magnetic salesperson. Yes, sometimes you actually have to ask, but actually in our lived experience, we close more deals by the customer closing themselves than us closing. Yeah. Somebody just says, Craig, we're ready, what's next? And I go, oh my God, they just closed the deal. Sometimes I have to hey, say, hey Steve, you know, we've been through quite a journey together. Are you ready to, are you ready to move on this? And yeah. sometimes I get a yes and we're done. Sometimes I get a no, that's just an objection. And I say, great, what's standing in our way? And then I, I use the five steps of handling objections, the skills and disciplines of handling objections. But closing is just, is just if, if, if we spend time, that, you know, here's what I say to people. Don't spend a nanosecond thinking about closing. Spend all day thinking about being a magnetic person and you will close more than you could ever dream. Yeah, I, I always tell my sales reps that if, you, if, they, if, they, if they have done the, the sales process correctly and they've, they've communicated the value that the customer is going to receive from our product and they've, they've, uh, they've quantified the value that the, the customer will receive and they've dis displayed it to them so they've, they've proven that it exists and they've overcome all the objections, the deal closes itself. Sometimes you still have to ask, um, obviously, uh, sure. to push it along faster but uh and close each step to the next but for certain but you but a a well run sales cycle effectively closes itself opt in um absolutely so um what other things would you like to tell our off, our audience about um successful strategies for sales reps working from home just as an open ended what else do you think Gosh, I mean, we, we hit routines, um, you know, if you can carve out, if you can implement a, a routine with, uh, with some discipline built in and you can carve out some time, maybe that came from your old commute or whatever, um, I would suggest, you know, one, well, I'll just suggest one that's personal and this won't fit a bunch of your audience, but I'll try it. I mentioned I've been reading a bunch of books. Well, what that translates into is some offers, meaning you know, hey, Steve, I just read this great or reread this great book or just picked up this book and I, it's on negotiations and I learned a few things. I'm wondering, you know, given that you've got some salespeople out in the field doing negotiations, I wonder if a quick chat with them on a half hour Zoom would make sense for them. And again, I'm not asking for money, but if, you know, and this goes, this is all, you know, all these things are pieces of a puzzle, Steve. It's like, you know, you went, you talked about ghosting earlier. Well, what do we need when, when people are ghosting us? We need a reason to talk to them. That's a reason to talk to them. So a way to use your time here when, you know, and I realize people are still busy. Some people are more busy in this virtual world and I, I, I respect that. But one of the ways to do that is just to think about what could I be doing that could translate into something that's either interesting to talk to a, a prospect about, gives me reason to call a client, or gives me a thing to make an offer that I don't have to spend 10,000 hours delivering the offer, but I can make a quick offer and it's meaningful. It will have value for somebody. Yeah. A great example that just happened uh, yesterday to me, actually um, a sales rep for a company that I, I I've uh, I know their CEO a little bit and I've like, I, I, and I, I use their freemium product, but their sales rep called up and they have some kind of, uh, they basically do like a free little consulting engagement on something that's not even that related to their, their company the thing that they do they do like uh uh dunning emails like the kind of emails that, like you get sent automatically if like your credit card's broken from a company oh, okay. um, they have a whole process on that and a, and a piece of software on it and uh and and they called they, they sent me an email and saying hey just touching base how you want to see how you're doing wanted to know if you'd thought about your pricing strategies lately we've got you know you know we've, we've built, built out all this research on pricing and how SaaS companies should price their products and um, I, you know, if you'd like, I'll, I'll jump on a call with you and kind of take a look at your pricing and, and see what kind of expertise that's an or, offer. You know, give, give, give you your, give us, give you our expertise in this. And I was like, yeah, sure. Whereas if he had called me and said, Hey, do you want to take a look at our dunning software again? I would say, no, I don't need your dunning software. I'm fine. Yeah, that's, but, an, that's an offer. 
Yeah. So it's a, it, very, it can be very effective. You know, it, it doesn't have to be, I mean, the thing they're offering me has nothing to do with what they actually do, but certainly they're going to get to pitch their thing again. And, and I'm bringing my head of product management because I want him, him to hear this too. And, um, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's, one, it, it's making offers with what you have can be a very powerful strategy. Um, right. Well, let's move into the next section, the sales in 60 seconds. Yeah, I know we're running out of time, so let's do it. All right. Um, what are the biggest mistakes that you see sales teams making with regard to virtual sales? Packing 10 pounds in a two pound bag. That's the biggest mistake. Yep. Does virtual, sell <laughs> Does virtual selling mean reinventing your sales process or methodology? No, it does not. Um, we're in, I'm a nut about sales process and methodology, Steve, as you can probably tell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, each step of the sales process should be incredibly crisp. I don't think anything changes in the virtual world other than the, the nuances we've talked about here for the past hour. I don't think anything changes. Don't change your sales process. In, 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 in fact, if you're going to do anything, ratchet it down even more. Get more disciplined, more crisp. Absolutely. What digital tools should be in every virtual seller's toolkit that maybe they're overlooking right now? what I call visuals. And I, I just alluded to this earlier in our conversation and I apologize. I didn't go in any depth really quickly. A visual is a one is a one P one page picture of the challenge, the solution over the years, I've collected tons of these. I have my designer design them all the time and they are just one page visuals. They're never complete. Cause you can't tell, you know, you can't, you know, show how to build a nuclear power plant in one visual but you can say, here's the rough process or here's the benefits of the solution. And it takes a level of creativity and grit to get to a visualization. Man, I think in the physical and virtual world, this is, this is a, we have had nothing but success with these visuals. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, well, and a lot of our customers are accustomed to, leave, or a lot of our listeners in the show are, are accustomed to having leave behinds, right? That where they, are, they leave behind a, a, a pamphlet of some kind. Yeah. And digitally, you can, you can do this too, and it, it, can be, it can be really effective there as well. Yep. What's no your doubt. number one piece of advice for sales managers who might be struggling to transition their field sales team into an inside sales team temporarily here? Well, I snuck three in, so I'll focus on one because my three were model the behavior, practice, 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 and feedback. Give, give people feedback. But I'll, you asked for one. The number one piece is, of advice is model the behavior. If you're crisp with your salespeople, chances are they'll be crisp with their people. If you're just ebbing and flowing and sitting back and shooting the shit on Zoom and filling an hour with fat and not muscle, guess what your salespeople are doing? That's yep. on you. So true. Um, what is your number one tip for sales reps to maintain their motivation while they're selling virtually? Personally, work out. You know, I, I, again, I'm, I'm cheating. I'm, I'm, I'm saying too, get up early and work out. Professionally, carve out more time for prospecting. Nobody wants to hear this from me, but I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a sales guy. I'm a sales manager and I'm a CEO. I'm all three of those things. I'm prospecting. You're damn right I'm prospecting. And so, you know, we just, we got to do this. You will get done with a week. And if you were prospecting for, you know, two hours on Tuesdays and two hours on Thursday mornings before the virus, do two hours on Tuesday, two on Wednesday and two on Thursday, you will thank yourself at the end of the week. And you sure as hell will thank yourself on Monday morning. But keep, keep your body healthy and your mindset right. Work out, get up early. It will pay tremendous dividends. And as an actionable takeaway, what is the one thing everyone in the virtual selling space should be doing right now? Empathizing. Just stopping, staying in the question, just saying, hey, how are you doing? How are people in your unit? How's the business? Is there anything I can do? So it's, it's, the, it's the empathy, and again, I'm cheating, but empathy and making offers. Those are the things that I think if we all do that well, it's the human thing to do, it's the right thing to do, and it will, it will pay dividends because you'll be the person who's memorable and meaningful at the end of that week for that person or at the end of the day. All right, well, I'm going to attempt to summarize what Craig has uh, taught us today. First of all, 
keep your meetings snappy. When you schedule a time with someone, keep it short and give them something back that will help them gain back time. Set the tone that shit's going to get done when I talk to this person. Um, you, know, you're, you want your, your prospect to feel like their, their time is well spent with you. So if they're talking to you, they, you want them to feel like it, you're gonna get stuff done for them. Um, managers can lead during this time better by modeling the behavior that they wanna see out of their reps, um, practicing and, and helping their reps practice and giving their reps feedback. Run crisp virtual meetings without fluff. Um, even elite performers have to practice and feedback is so important. So uh, it's important to give constructive feedback to your team and practice in these times. Prospecting should be increased during these times when we're, when we're at home here uh, or in any hard economic time. Ask, make little asks, ask for a little bit of time and make sure you lead with empathy and, and empathize and know that, that uh, your, where your prospects are coming from right now might not be what you imagine. Start every call by asking people how they're doing. Um, if, if it does, if offer up at, within the sales cycle, offer, hey, if, if now's not the time, just let me know. Um, and, and if now is not the time, they communicate that to you. Uh, it is, it's fair game to ask wh when, when would be the right time? Is, is this something that I should just go dark for a while? Is there a specific time I should, I should reach back out? And also don't forget to ask for referrals. That is still fair game. Uh, be free, feel free to ask, hey, is there anyone in your network that would be, that would be interested in this product or service that I'm offering? When you meet with a prospect, include these elements. Open with empathy. Be very prepared. Um, you know, not, not, you can't cover everything that you want to cover. You, 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 uh, you might have to, if you looked at everything you wanted to cover, try to take 30% of that out. Infuse positive energy into your meetings. Find a way to be playful and don't take yourself too seriously. Um, when you close, make people an offer. You know, is there anything I can do for you in these times? Or is there, is there any, you know, make sure you offer the value that you, that you can lead with, even if it's not specifically related to what you usually do. What you want to achieve in every meeting is that your prospect remembers your meeting out of all the meetings they've had in that day. And, and remember that people do have Zoom fatigue. Make it, Make an offer or making an offer involves listening really closely to, to what your prospect or customer needs. Great, great sellers listen on three levels. They listen and understand what's important and therefore they know exactly what to offer. If someone's ghosting you, get help. Leave a voicemail calling out the question or maybe have your manager call the prospect. Get creative. Send your prospect a creative message to get their attention, like a picture showing their problem and, and letting them know that you've thought of them and, and, and that you've thought of them to, and you could help them. And get scrappy. Go back to your stakeholder map, try to contact someone else, send a FedEx, FedEx letter to get, to get attention. To improve your virtual presentation skills, make sure you break, you're, you're able to break the script and surprise people in a pleasant way. Don't rely too much on your slides, rely less on your slides in these times. Show a picture and paint a picture of your solution. Tell the right story at the right time for the right reasons. Get in your audience's mindset, empathize with them. Remember, People will not work to understand your message. You will have to work to be understood. And that is more relevant in these times over in virtual meetings and Zoom than it is in person. When you're closing the deal, closing is the natural outcome of a sales cycle done well. When you show up for, for, for your, your prospect every day and you show up in every way and you're there for them and you do it, do the, the parts of the sales cycle appropriately, then you will get the close. So Craig, tell me, this has been absolutely fantastic. Where can listeners read more about your work? Where can they reach out to you? 
Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you can tell. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. My, my last name is Wortman, W-O-R-T as in Tom, M-A-N-N, two N, so man with two Ns. I, on Instagram, I'm just at Craig Wortman. And then on my sales engine site is probably the best place to reach me if you're, if you're not a social media person, but it's just, just like it sounds, salesengine.com, just like it sounds. I'm, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm pretty active on Instagram Live and, um, and, and the, the social media platforms. And then obviously you can also find me on the faculty site at the Kellogg Graduate School. So those are the, the main places to find me. Thanks for asking. Fantastic. Well, Craig, this has been an absolutely awesome episode of the Outside Sales Talk, and I really appreciate your time today. If you can think of, uh, if, any, if anyone out there can think of other sales reps that would benefit from hearing what Craig's told us, feel free to share this episode uh, and, and send it along to them. Take care until next, time, until next time, everybody, and thanks, Craig, so much for being here. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to your audience. I really appreciate people listening. Stay safe, everybody. Bye.